The Humble Harvest and Eternal Voices, Part 5. I asked how the child had been killed. The reply given was in substance the same as the old man's. With both hands she slowly and solemnly raised the blood-stained cover off the little breast, saying in sobs as she did so, Just look here. Deeds of valor are no longer dreams gone by. We live in nightly days. Our men are dauntless men. Will there ever be one to write the life of the common soldier? The regiment had not lost a man to be sure, but had seen a genuine fight, heard the scream of the shells, and seen a caisson blown up and men knocked over. Last night it rained for an hour or so. It put the ground in fine order for seeding. I sent the wagon to Mr. Moore and 27 bushels by measure. No military to be seen on our side of the hill. Ann Willis Ambler sees all from her parents' farm at Rock Hall. Pa is becoming rather tired of our South Carolina soldier. Thinks he is sufficiently well to leave. And Heroes von Bork keeps one eye out for an empty seat at a dinner table. And I enjoyed the ride the more for being fortunate enough firing from my horseback with my revolver to kill a gray squirrel, which as our mess arrangements had been thrown into utter disorder by the events, was gladly welcomed the same evening on our dinner table. October 17, 1862, The day after the battle, William McCarter sees Lily in Charlestown and the price of war. Farms continue their ways. And both armies move down the valley to clash again. The day before, Charles Aglenby at his Mount Pleasant farm had written in his diary, The Yankees drove in the Confederate pickets. There was considerable firing near Charlestown with cannon. Some few killed and wounded. A body of cavalry were in our lower field in the evening. About 30 Yankee cavalry passed through Mr. Moore's and Mr. Ranson's field in sight of our house and the retiring cavalry and artillery of the Confederates passed before our house. October 17th, Friday. Last night it rained for an hour or so. It put the ground in fine order for seeding. Some cannonading was heard at different times at points from Shepherdstown to Leedtown and Miss Belle Compton stayed all night and spent the day. Last night, October 16th to 17th, was about as dark as they generally get in this country. I was on guard duty during the fore part of the night and it rained very hard all through the whole watch. We had no fire until after midnight, the ground, wood, and everything else being soaking wet. Even the darkness felt like a wet blanket. I made my bed on top of a rock pile. It was a little hardish at first, but it was the driest place.
an intelligent Negro arrived here this morning from Berryville. He'd left there last night. He said there is one regiment of cavalry and four pieces of artillery between here and Berryville. The 2nd, 3rd, 6th, 7th, 9th, and 12th Virginia Cavalries. The next day when we received orders to return, the Army then marched to Halltown and occupied that position during the night. The next morning, the 18th, after an examination of the roads, and it being found there was no enemy in front, the command returned to Harper's Ferry. I appointed Colonel J.R. Brook of the 53rd Pennsylvania Volunteers as military governor to better preserve order. About a hundred officers and soldiers of the Confederate Army were found in the town, consisting entirely, it is believed, of surgeons, hospital attendants, convalescents, and sick. And 27 were sent to the Provost Marshal at Harper's Ferry, and 38 wounded and unable to be removed were paroled time did not permit paroling of all who were severely wounded as they were scattered throughout the town and requiring more time than we had for that purpose to find them. My God, my Father, while I stray far from my home in life's rough way Oh, teach me from my heart to say Thy will be done. <laughs> October 16th, 1862, in the late afternoon, Private McCarter was sent into town to assist Brooks' men in arresting and paroling wounded Confederate soldiers in Charlestown. He wrote later of what he saw. Though dark my path and sad my lot, let me be still and murmur not. War is truly said to be a sad necessity. Or breathe the prayer divinely taught. But civil war, be it long or short, thy will be done and under almost any circumstance is indeed sadder and more desolating in its effects. History may record the ravages and desolations made and left in the tracks of the bloody feet of war, even in this most unnatural contest of our own. Painters of the rarest talents may one day paint the destruction in masterly styles and glowing colors. Yet, all these efforts fall far short in showing to the eye or to the mind war's real effects upon people and country. Thy will be done. I proceeded along one of the streets of this ill-fated town, Charlestown, accompanied by several members of my regiment. Our attention was attracted to a three-story house, one of the better class of dwellings there, by crowds of soldiers and a few citizens going into it. These visitors came immediately out with dull and saddened countenances, or in a few cases with tearful eyes. 
The front door had apparently been smashed and laid about in pieces upon the cobblestone pavement opposite. We stopped and, following the example of others, entered the house and then the room on the first floor. What though in lonely grief I sigh For friends beloved no longer nigh Submissive still would I reply Thy will be done Merciful heaven, what a sight met our eyes. God save me the pain of another such sight as long as I live. long and narrow from one end to the other regardless of those present paced a lady apparently not over 30 years of age she appeared to be in a terrible grief refusing entirely any comfort or consolation from those of her friends and neighbors they are congregated the woman was clad in black In the same manner, her dress had been almost torn from her body. She would now and then burst out in heart-rending fits of weeping and exclaiming, Oh, my child, my lily! Not knowing exactly the cause of the lady's sorrow, I quietly inquired of an old man leaning against the door what it was. He replied that her child had been killed about an hour ago by a ball from a federal battery. The round passed through a window at which the child had been standing, looking down at soldiers on the street. At one end of the room, a few women and several members of our Irish brigade were gathered around what seemed to me to be a melodeon gazing sadly and silently at something lying on its top. As soon as opportunity presented to approach the spot, we did so. There, on the top of the instrument, lay a sweet little girl, cold and stiff and dead, except for the dead yet still beautiful, innocent, pale face. All the rest of the body was covered with a large sheet or white quilt. And on this quilt, particularly that part of it over the child's breast, were large spots of blood. A young colored woman was cutting the long down curls from the child's head and perfectly saturating them with her tears. Approaching still nearer, I asked how the child had been killed. The reply given was in substance the same as the old man's. With both hands she slowly and solemnly raised the blood-stained cover off the little breast, saying in sobs as she did so, just look here. My companion and I gazed for a moment at the object in horror and dismay, unable to utter a word. Then turning slowly and sadly away, we left the room. My heart was too full and my eyes positively refused shelter any longer. Streams of hot water that burst from them. The ball had struck the child on the left breast tearing it and ripping the left arm completely away. Only a small portion of the right breast remained. 
It presented the most ghastly, sickening appearance yet. That dear little face seemed as calm and peaceful as in a sweet, quiet slumber. A cruel, cruel war! Must the innocent suffer with the guilty? What though in lonely grief I sigh For friends beloved no longer nigh Submissive still would I reply Thy will be done Friday, October 17th Yesterday evening, there came the news that two fights had occurred in town, and our men had to retreat, leaving the enemy in possession. They occupied the inn and advanced on every road, driving in our pickets early this morning. Nat left us to search for his company, but returned and passed the night. Saturday, October 18th. The news is that the Yankees have fallen back from Charlestown and our troops are advancing. About 2,000 cavalry passed by our gate. The forage masters were here again today. Pa sold them a barrel of whiskey for $10 a gallon. George Neese writes from camp. This morning we moved to our old camp again, four miles from Charlestown on the Berryville Pike. This afternoon the first piece was ordered to go on picket at our old post one mile below Charlestown on the Harpers Ferry Pike. This evening we left our camp one mile south of Charlestown and camped with the 6th Virginia Cavalry. They had a prayer meeting in their camp in the early evening by candlelight, which I attended. The 6th seems to be the citadel of religion of the brigade, as they have more religious service in the 6th than in any of the other regiments. Yet I do not know, as the plane of practical ethics in general is any higher in this than any of the other regiments of the brigade. I suppose that their code of imprecations is of about the same standard as that adopted by the rest of the brigade and perhaps employed with about equal frequency. During the recent skirmish at Charlestown, the Federals had also sent a force under Generals Andrew Humphreys and Alfred Pleasanton down Lee Town Pike to try and rout out General Jeb Stewart's men headquartered at the Dandridge's home called the Bower. And, but for making a turn with their cavalry down the wrong road near Strider's Mill, they could well have captured Stewart. Afterwards, men under Confederate General A.P. Hill, who had moved on down towards Berryville as the Federals advanced, told Josiah Ware at his Clark County home called Springfield just what had happened to Jeb Stewart. Drawing from what some of General A.P. Hill's infantrymen related, while Cavalry General Stewart's headquarters were at Dandridge's in Jefferson, he was dancing with the girls when the Yankees had planned a raid and would have caught him and his staff, only they missed the road. And in the pursuit and fighting the enemy, Stewart was only saved by being caught 
by losing his hat and jumping with his horse a garden railing. <laughs> Stuart's men had, indeed, completed a second full-blown ball at the Bower just on the night of the 15th that extended into the wee hours of the 16th. German born Eros von Bork, one of Jeb Stewart's staff officers, confirms Stewart's very close call after a good party. The beams of the morrow's sun were just making their way through the intricacies of the foliage above our heads as we lay in camp, resting from the fatigues of the night's dancing. When a blast of the bugle brought the whole command to their feet with its summons to new and serious activity, we found a full division of the Federal infantry moving upon us in admirable order, their cavalry operating on either flank and their artillery seeking to get into position upon some heights in our front, where several pieces had already arrived and had opened a brisk and annoying fire upon our horsemen. Large clouds of dust rising all along the road toward Shepherdstown indicated the approach of other bodies of the enemy, and it was quite plain that our resistance to odds so overwhelming could only be of short duration. The Bower were only a few hours before the violin and banjo had sent forth their enlivening strains, riding forward to the scene of action which already resounded with wilder music. About dusk, the Federals came to a halt, and to our infinite surprise turned slowly back for a mile and a half, where we soon saw the main body go quietly into bivouac. During the chase offered them by General Humphreys and General Pleasanton, Jeb Stuart and his men found themselves caught in that same rain from that day. The general then proceeded his staff to headquarters at the Bower, which was only a few miles distant. Before we reached there, we were overtaken by a drenching shower of rain and we thankfully accepted Mr. Dandridge's kind invitation upon our arrival to dry our dripping garments and warm our chilled bodies before a roaring wood fire in the large and comfortable family drawing room. A renewed assault the next morning, October 17th, put von Bork with some men further south in Middleway in Smithfield to watch for the enemy. Finding none, he found another social windfall. I had not been more than an hour in the village of Smithfield when our outposts from the Shepherdstown Road came galloping along in furious haste, reporting a tremendous host of cavalry right behind them in hot pursuit. The squadron had come from Harper's Ferry along a by-road which struck the turnpike at a point about midway between Carneysville and Smithfield. I established my men and myself at the house of an interesting young widow, who with her sister enlivened our evening with songs and spirited discourse. The next morning, we received orders to return to the bower. It was a sparkling, beautiful morning of autumn, and I enjoyed the ride the more for being fortunate enough, firing from my horseback with my revolver, to kill a gray squirrel, which as our mess arrangements had been thrown into utter disorder by the events of the last two days, was gladly welcomed the same evening on our dinner table.
a month later at Mount Pleasant, the Aglenby's farm. Wednesday, November 19th. Pleasant but a little cloudy. The hands cutting and mauling wood. Ralph doing some odd jobs, setting out cabbage stalks and fixing gate hinges. Our Bowerly and son cleaned out the pool. Captain Buck's company went by and returned this morning and by again this evening. Mrs. A. and Frank went to Charlestown this evening. No news of any consequence from the war. Mr. Whittington is cutting up some dead trees on the halves. I went to Captain Abel's in the afternoon, met Colonel Marshall and Lieutenant Buck there. Captain loaned me some small pieces of pork if I should ever have need for them. Wednesday, November 19th. Mr. Thompson was here and seemed to have some hope of the war ending. He and Pa both agreed that the best thing that could happen would be a reconstruction of the Union. Can it be possible? I am sure I know not, but it seems not to me. I don't see how we could ever live in peace and love one another, though I'm sure we can never be a great nation separate. Oh, that God may bring order out of confusion and bring out once peaceful and happy country out of this cruel war.